Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For though I the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, in proportion to our faith. If service, in our serving. The one who teaches, in his teaching. The one who exhorts, in his exhortation. The one who contributes, in generosity. The one who leads, with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy, with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honour. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Well, friends, this, this is our, our third sermon in our short series on prayer. And uh, I imagine that, uh, that every Christian here would, would already be convinced that prayer is something that is so very important. And more than that, I think there are many of us here, I imagine that there are many of us here who would want to pray uh, more often, who want to pray in a better spirit, and want to be constant in our prayer. And some of you are, and you're a great encouragement to us. And so can I urge you, keep, keep going and keep encouraging us. But for some of us here, uh, it's hard work. Not always, but it seems so very often it's just hard work. And we know, perhaps you know the statistics as people do research on this and they say so many Christians of our, uh, of our age and so many churches of our age are marked by prayerlessness, uh, whether that be in private or whether that be in public. And so constantly and consistently the least attended meeting that a church has is its prayer meeting. And that would be true of us, I think. And the least persistent activity we do personally is often private prayer. And so on the one hand, uh, we know we ought to pray and uh, we know that prayer is central. We know it's important. We know it's a privilege. And yet, on the other hand, our actions often reflect the very opposite of what we believe and know to be true. And uh, I guess if I said to you, how would you sum, how would you sum up Trinity Church? If you, if, you, if you had to sum us up, and if you had to reflect on what we're like, what our strengths are, I mean, I, th- I think we're good at organising. I think that's not hard to see, but so much of what we do. I think uh, we work hard, Not all, we don't always get this right, but boy, we work hard to care for those in need. Uh, so many here are sharp theologically, unusually so, I think. So many uh, just know their Bibles well. What about our prayer? Where would you, where would you score us on our prayer? Uh, one person reflecting on this in our current age, says, 
Are we better at organising than we are at agonising in prayer? Are we better at arguments than adoration? And it's a good, it's a, it's a good question, isn't it? It's a good question for us as individuals here, and, and it's a good question for us as, as a church. And what about you? What about when we don't pray? Well, I'm hoping I can say a few things this morning that will, that will help us uh, and perhaps give some reasons why we don't pray and some ways in which we might uh, overcome those. And it might be we don't pray because we have, have head problems. There's a problem in our thinking. Do you have a head problem? For example, has your thinking about God's sovereignty made you prayerless? Uh, one of the sadder things, I think, is, is when the, wonder, the most wonderful truth about, about God and his sovereignty can lead us to prayerlessness. And I think it's because we don't really understand God's sovereignty. And we are a church... And I know that so many here are convinced that the Bible teaches very clearly that God is in control of all things and he has a set plan and purpose and nothing can thwart uh, his will and what God intends to do for all eternity. And we rejoice in that. And one of the things that can happen as we consider that for a time is that we think if, if God is the one who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of of his will, then surely, surely it's a bit cheeky, uh, surely it's a bit rude of me to badger him with things. Surely he doesn't change the course of the universe because some finite and ignorant and sinful human being asks him to. And so sadly, I think, our prayer can evaporate into our understanding of the doctrine of God's sovereignty but is it because we haven't thought about it and read enough of the Bible, do you think, at that stage? And the astounding thing is that over and over and over again, as you read through the Scriptures, you see that God is a sovereign God with a sovereign plan and that his plan over and over and over again includes the prayers of his people. That God simultaneously is pictured as utterly in control of all things And at exactly the same time, a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God. And so while those two things might not fit together easily in your mind, they fit together side by side on the pages of the Bible. Ezekiel, a prophet in his time when the people of God had rebelled against the living God and were punished, and God speaks about the day in which he would change the hearts of his people so that they would live in obedience to him. And when Ezekiel seeks to know how it is that God is going to do that, he's told that the sovereign Lord will stir up his people so that they would come to him in prayer and that he would answer their prayer. God has a plan and that, and that plan includes the prayers of his people. The prophet Daniel understood from the scriptures that the period of uh, 70 years of the exile was drawing to a close and God would then bring them back out of exile. When he knows that's true, and, and Daniel knew that God was utterly sovereign and he knew that God was personal. And so when the 70 years is up in Daniel 9, he addresses himself to the personal God and prays for the very thing that God had promised. And in fact, it was precisely because Daniel's aware of the promises of a personal and sovereign God that he, that he feels obliged to pray in accordance with what he has learned in Scripture regarding the will of God. God has a plan, and that plan includes the prayers of his people and the prayers of his church. Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, speaks about his own deliverance and his confident that he will be protected and he will be delivered in the situation that he's in from temptation. And he says in Philippians chapter 1, in verse 19, he says, For I know that through your prayers 
and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. How will God deliver Paul? By God's Spirit working in Paul so that he knows all sorts of good things and as God answers the prayers of the Philippians as they pray for Paul. God has a plan and prayer is part of the plan. Do, do you see the privilege? I mean, it's an astounding thing, isn't it? That the God of the universe is pleased, delighted to include our prayers in his plan. Now, you might say, you know, look, I still don't get how that works. And look, to be honest, I don't either. I don't fully understand it. But do you have to? Do you have to? Does Jesus pray? Yes. Does he know more about his sovereign father and the way in which sovereignty works? Does he know more than you? Yes. Does he tell you to pray? Absolutely. Do we need to know more? Don't let wrong thinking lead to prayerlessness. Well, that might be you, a head problem, uh, wrong thinking at that point. But what about this wrong thinking? Has your sense of unworthiness made you prayerless? Is that what's happening in your head? And it can be hard to pray, and I understand that. It can be hard to come into the presence of of a holy God, when you've fallen into gross sin, when you're stuck in habitual sin, and you think, again, again I'm coming to pray? Again for forgiveness? Just moments before when I pray. Or when you have such a tender conscience to your, to your unworthiness before a holy God, and you think, how can I come again into his presence? When I've mucked things up so badly... And that can be a real issue. Too ashamed? I mean, surely the God of all the universe is sick and tired of me. That's a lie. That is a lie from Satan himself. That is a lie. And you know that's not true. And your head might say it's true, but you know it. You, you've read enough of the Bible to know that doesn't even come close to your Heavenly Father. Do you remember the, do you remember the story uh, in John's Gospel of the Samaritan woman? That, that woman who'd spent her entire life up to that point seeking to fulfill her longings and her deep desires in the arms of different men. And when she meets Jesus, she's had five husbands, none of whom have satisfied her heart, and, she, and she's living with the sixth man. She's mucked it up big time. And, 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 it, and this part of the Bible, it says, the, the Samaritan woman said to Jesus, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink? You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Jesus is saying, if you just knew the gift that God gives, if you knew who I was, then you would ask, ask, same word that's often used for pray, you would, uh, you would pray to me, and I'd give it. Was she unworthy? Yes. Has she mucked it up? Too right she has. And Jesus says, ask, ask. Does he give her living water? He sure does. Do you know what the truth is? You're actually never worthy to come to Jesus Christ in prayer. You never have been and you never will be. You'll only come to him unworthy. <laughs> And he says, come. He says, ask. You know, there's a direct connection, I think, between not 
knowing Jesus well and not asking him for much. But you know him. So stop believing what your head is telling you at that point and listen to him. Do you have a head problem? A way of thinking that has led to prayerlessness? Well, for you it mightn't be a head problem. For you it might be a heart problem, an attitude problem. Let's speak about that for a bit. Now, uh, can I speak a bit personally? I don't often use really personal illustrations, um, but I hope this one is okay. When, um, when Annie, my eldest daughter, had finished the HSC, she did a gap year, and she worked at McDonald's and, uh, for two weeks in, in that year. She decided that she wanted to go to South Africa for a, for a holiday. Uh, she wanted to spend a week with an animal sanctuary and a, and a week at an orphanage. Now, if you know anything about South Africa, then you'll know that it's one of the most dangerous countries in the world. And uh, she flew into Johannesburg, uh, which is one of the most dangerous cities in the world. And I was nervous, to say the least, uh, but before she went, I, I, I got this the most dreadful foreboding that she would die in South Africa. And uh, it, 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 it was, I mean, it was in my head. I'm not saying it was a message from God because um, he got it wrong, if, and therefore it wasn't from God. But uh, it was overwhelming. It's like a premonition that she would die that I just couldn't get out of my head. And so when I, when I took her to the airport, I mean, I was overwhelmed and I, I felt absolutely certain that it was going to be the last time that I would see her um, and I remember walking I remember driving back from the airport and just weeping uncontrollably the whole way home and for two weeks I felt utterly desperate and helpless and I think I prayed more in those two weeks than I've ever prayed in my entire life I mean I prayed that she would live and I prayed that if she died it would be quick and I prayed that she would belong to the, I prayed that she belonged to Jesus and that I'd see her again in eternity and I, 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 I prayed that whatever happened I'd trust Jesus and I, 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 I prayed that God would give me sleep at night when anxiety kept me awake and I prayed and thankfulness for every moment of contact we had with her by phone. And I prayed in the morning and I'd pray in the car on the way to work and I'd pray in the shower and I'd pray at incidental times in the day, and uh, I prayed because of two things, I think. I prayed because I knew I belonged to a merciful and gracious Heavenly Father who was wise and good and powerful. And the second reason I prayed is because I was utterly helpless and utterly desperate. Those two things meant I prayed. Here's the point. Why is it, do you think, that I ever believed for a moment that that situation is different? That I belong to a gracious Heavenly Father who is wise and good and all-powerful and that I am utterly helpless and utterly desperate. And that if the Lord doesn't hold me today and sustain me today and protect me today and bless me today, then I won't last a second. If Satan could get hold of me, I wouldn't last a second. And if the Lord doesn't hold this church and sustain it and protect it, then we'd be gone before the afternoon hits. What sort of arrogant, self-confident heart do I have that believes that most of the time I'm not utterly helpless and utterly desperate? We are people who are in desperate need of blessing from our Heavenly Father.
I mean, some of you are young Christians and you've only been believers for a very short time and there are, there are ways in which you've changed the way in which you live but the old ways will call you back and the old ways will pull at your heart and they will be strong and you won't last a second because you are utterly desperate and you are utterly helpless and you need great blessing from your Heavenly Father. Some of you have been Christians for a long, long time. Yet there is always temptation to slow down. There is always temptation to be slack. There is always temptation to lip, slip into a lukewarm affection for Christ. You are utterly desperate and you are utterly hopeless and in need of blessing from your Heavenly Father. Some of you are despised for being a Christian. Now, it might be at work or at home or at school and it wears you down and people will not let you follow Christ in peace. They attack you and they mock you and they accuse you and you are desperate and you are helpless and you need great blessing from your Heavenly Father. Some of you here have grown bitter angry towards a brother and sister. They've, maybe they've wronged you. Maybe you just perceive it's wrong. But that bitterness has festered and grown and fed on your anger. And even now you're excusing your actions and your heart has become hard and you are utterly desperate and you are utterly helpless in need of great blessing from your Heavenly Father. Shall I go on? I could, couldn't I? What is it for you? I mean, have a look at the passage that uh, Miss read and Paul speaks for 11 chapters about the astounding privileges that belong to, to us in Jesus Christ. Justified by the faithfulness of Christ, you are clean before God, adopted as a, as a child of the living God. God is your heavenly Father, changed by the Spirit to be more and more like Jesus, and in the light of those, and how ought we to live? Romans 12 kicks in. And, but let me just pick up just a few of the verses from verse 9, say, that love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, uh, un, outdo one another in showing honour, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation. How are you doing? Can you handle that? Can you manage that? And is it a surprise then at the end of those things he says, be constant in prayer? Friends, we live in a hostile world. Friends, you've got a hostile heart. And if left to ourselves, we would stumble and we would fall and bring dishonour to the name of Jesus Christ and we would do it so quickly we'd hardly have time to take breath. We're in great need, friends, if we are to continue to stand firm as Christians, if we are to continue to stand firm as a church. Why do we believe for a moment that we're anything other, other than utterly helpless and utterly desperate? It's, it, it's a little bit arrogant, isn't it? thinking that we can make it ourselves. So a prayerless Christian is a little bit like a bus driver trying to push his bus out of a bog because he doesn't need Clark Kent who's sitting on the front seat. A prayerless Christian is a little bit like having all your walls papered with $500 notes but eating out of the trash can because you can make it on your own. A prayerless Christian doesn't believe that he or she is utterly desperate and utterly helpless. Do you have a heart problem? An attitude problem? Well, there's two categories. Do you have a head problem, something with your thinking? Do you have a heart problem, an attitude problem? Third and last, do you have a, do you have a planning problem? What do I mean by that? It strikes me that the devil defeats 
most praying before it happens because you never make a plan. And if you don't plan to pray, believe me, you won't pray. If you want to take a four-week holiday, you don't just wake up one morning and say, well, hey, let's all go on holidays today. And if you do do that, I can bet you, you won't go on holidays. If you haven't planned, you won't go. And yet that's just exactly how so many of us treat prayer. And is there any surprise? Then we get to the end of another day and we haven't prayed. Do you have a plan? I'm not saying for a moment that it can't be spontaneous uh, and halfway through the day you can pray. Sure, sure. But that aside, do you have a plan when you'll pray that day, regardless of the spontaneous things which you'll do as well? Do you have a place, somewhere where you won't be distracted, somewhere where you won't see the dust on the windowsill? Because it's always easy to dust. It's the only time it's easier to dust. Where you don't have your phone and you don't have your iPad. You may go for a walk. I mean, there's no rules around it. It says sit still when you pray, but make a plan, find a place, and make it work. And be smart about it. Like if you're cold, put on a jumper. If you're hot, take your jumper off. It's not particularly godly to be cold or hot when you're praying. Now Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon used to tell his, tell his students, it's no good praying in a cold bedroom. Otherwise, you're forever on your knees, mentally lighting the fire in your head. It may be for you when you pray, you need a softer chair. It may be for you that you fall asleep in a softer chair, so you need a harder chair. Some people write down their prayers. It helps them concentrate. Some people speak them out loud. Find it focuses their mind. Some people pray with others because they find it hard to pray by themselves. I will say this. Combine it with your Bible reading. Take what you read in a passage from the Bible and turn it into a prayer. Some people just read a passage and with their eyes open, looking at that passage, just make it into a prayer as they look through the verses. It's not a bad thing to do. It's very good, in fact. God has given us great freedom. So we need to be wise in the way in which we pray and pray as you can and don't pray as you can't. Do you feel, a, do you feel the battle? Is it a battle for you? Did you expect it not to be? Satan will hate you praying. Jesus loves it. If your heart's sinful, it's going to be a battle. Friends, you know it's a great privilege, don't you? And you know we have a wonderful Heavenly Father. And you know you're utterly desperate. So let's be people of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to see how wonderful you are. Help us to know the privilege of coming into your presence and asking. Give us eyes to see how utterly desperate we are and we beg of you, make us a church and make us people who are constant in prayer. Amen.